So today's speaker is Lori Lutz, and she's speaking on viruses and cherries. Lori has a bachelor's degree from Indiana University, South Bend, and is currently a PhD candidate uh, here at OSU in the Department of Botany and Plant Pathology under Dr. Jay Scheidt, who many of you may have heard in one of our previous webinars on powdery mildew um, and other topics. And a cool thing about Lori, she previously worked as a scientist with uh, Agdea Incorporated, and this is a company that develops diagnostic kits and diagnostic methods for um, testing for plant pathogens. So she has a cool uh, industry background there. Um, so welcome, Lori, and we'll just give you a minute, and if you want to go through that process of just sharing your screen again. All right, so thank you all for joining today. Um, I am going to be talking about viruses and um, it'll kind of have a focus on the Pacific Northwest, but I am excited to see from the chat that we have folks joining us from um, all over the US, including the Midwest, which is where I'm, I'm originally from. Uh, I'm a Hoosier and I see, I saw at least one other Hoosier here. So uh, welcome. And um, so, Let's just go ahead and I'm going to overview what we'll be talking about today. Um, maybe. I'm not able to scroll. Hmm. Hmm. Um, have you, did you try using the oh, arrows? Okay, oh. I got it. Ooh. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so just a little bit what I'm going to be talking about. I'm just going to go over some virus basics because um, I assume that not everyone has knowledge of uh, plant viruses. So just kind of reviewing a little bit about what we're talking about. And then as promised, I'm going to be talking about choosing um, planting material because prevention is one of the best things for um, dealing with plant viruses. Then I'm going to talk about some common viruses, especially those that we see here in Oregon, um, but it will be relevant to all cherry growing areas. Um, talking a little bit about how we manage the dis those diseases and the vectors of those diseases. And then just for Fun at the end, I'm going to talk about a little science communication project that I do called Inspiration Dissemination. And then I would be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. So, just to um, review a little bit, so some common virus symptoms that we see. Um, so the thing about viruses is, is typically once you have a trained eye, you can kind of identify different symptoms associated with viruses specifically. So one thing we see is dwarfing and stunting, as you can see in the image here. Um, there's something called yellows, as you can see the, the leaves are yellowing. Mosaic, so you can see that the little uh, plant cells in this image are either yellow or green, kind of making a mosaic sort of pattern. Ring spots are one of the most unique um, characteristics that are pretty much exclusively associated with viruses. Um, and you can see some very pretty ring spots here. Um, color breaking, so you can see this tulip has both white and red, and the white on the petals of this tulip are caused by a virus called tulip breaking virus. So um, not all viruses are bad. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen tulips like these before, and the reason that we have this color breaking pattern is from a virus. So not all viruses kill the plant. So that's important to note that there is a range of severity. Um, we also have a leaf roll symptom, which is pretty self-explanatory. The leaves are rolled up and as you can imagine, there's probably lots of things that can cause that sort of symptom. And also fruit deformation. So just to kind of familiarize you with these terms and some different symptoms that viruses um, can cause on different hosts, but also specifically to cherry. We'll get into more detail about that. But the other thing to know about viruses is that there are um, many ways to transmit them. So one of the main ones, especially when talking about choosing a tree that you really want to pay attention to, is propagation material. So as you can see in this image here, we have a graft. And if either part of that graft, the rootstock or the scion, are infected, that virus can be transmitted in that process. 
There's also mechanical transmission. So as this image shows, that can literally mean that if you are pruning an infected tree or plant and go to move on to the next one, that you can transmit virus in that way. So cleaning of tools, especially when you know you're working with infected um, plants is very important. Another a method of transmission, which is um, important for cherries uh, due to the way that they are pollinated, is with bees. Um, and because they're transmitting that pollen potentially, especially as bees are trafficked all over, that opens up um, not only a lot of issues for the bees, as I'm sure you've heard, but um, also those bees can be transmitting virus in the pollen that they carry. Um, a couple insect vectors, of which there are many, but a couple that are specific to cherry are um, mealybugs, which you can see in the first image here, and also uh, leaf hoppers. And so I'll be talking about those insect vectors a little bit later and how they relate to some of our most prominent cherry, uh, cherry virus diseases. Nematodes are also another important um, transmission. So nematodes, nematodes are little uh, microscopic worms that live in the soil. And you can see in this image here where the arrow is pointing, that's a nematode that is in, um, injecting its stylet, so like its feeding tube into this root tip. And in that process, um, it can not only cause damage to the roots, but it can also transmit virus that are stuck to its mouth parts. And then another one, which is, um, can be problematic, especially in mature orchards, or if you have um, um, even just a couple mature trees in your backyard, this natural process of root grafting. So as trees grow, um, their roots grow underground as well. And eventually those, those roots will um, come together. And through the, the roots grafting together underground, that can transmit um, viruses or virus-like diseases as well. So now that I've familiarized you a little bit with some different virus symptoms, I just want to take a second and um, have you look at these six images and see if you can identify which ones are infected with a virus and which ones might be damaged by something else. I'll just give you a second to think about that. So as you can see from looking at these images, it's really hard to tell. So the first one here is actually herbicide damage. The second one is herbicide damage. The third one is actually a virus, tomato spot wilt virus. Um, again, these are all on tomato plants, so not cherry. Um, here we have herbicide damage again, more herbicide damage, and then this one's a virus, tomato mosaic virus. So what does this tell us? <laughs> this tells us the importance of diagnosis when working with um, viruses. So a couple terms that are used in plant pathology are sign and symptom. So a sign is the physical evidence of a pathogen. And you can see in the images here on the right and where the arrows are pointing that this is a pathogen where you can see the sign. This is powdery mildew. And so the sign you see here is the actual pathogen, the fungal pathogen, the powdery substance on the cherry, on the fruit. You can see that. And on the leaf here, you can also see some of the powdery uh, substance. So as opposed to a symptom, which is really what we only see for a virus, because for viruses, you can't see the virus particles unless you use a really high powered microscope, which are very expensive and rare. And um, even then it can be difficult to see them. So here in this case, the symptom we're seeing is the crumpling of the leaf and kind of a, the effect of the disease on the plant. So for viruses, similar to viruses in humans, um, there aren't any cures. And so prevention is really, really um, key for growing a healthy plant long-term. Um, as Brooke mentioned, I have a background in diagnostics, and so that kind of plays well into my work now, um, because diagnostic assays are used to detect viruses in plants. Um, here are just a few different types. So 
one that's used more in high throughput situations is called an ELISA. And um, this uh, plate you see here, when it turns yellow, that means it's a positive result. Um, when it's clear, it's negative. So these are the types of assays that would be used if you send plant material to a plant clinic, um, either at a university or a private lab. Um, another more user-friendly um, kit that even um, any of you could use in the field, and you can order these types of kits from different companies, um, are these little strip tests. And it uses the same technology as a pregnancy test, actually. <laughs> so um, your positive result is two lines, meaning instead of having a baby, um, you have a virus. And a negative result is one line, just showing that the test worked. So these are just um, a couple different types of diagnostic assays. There are many more um, that are uh, much more complex, but these are commonly used. All right, so um, let's talk a little bit about choosing planting material. So I emphasize the importance of preventing viruses, and there are um, organizations and networks that their main goal is to make sure that um, the plant material that you're purchasing, either from a nursery or um, wherever you purchase it from, is that it is clean, meaning that it is um, certified virus-free. So the Clean Plant Center Northwest and the Clean Plant Center Network throughout the whole United States has this motto of start clean, stay clean. Um, and so what this means is that the propagation material, when it um, is in its early stages, like the mother stock is tested for viruses of economic importance um, before being distributed out. And you can see um, the importance of this so we're not spreading disease all over the place within and, and outside of the U.S. Um, so the ones that are relevant in the Pacific Northwest are in Prosser, Washington, the Clean Plant Center Northwest, um, which is associated with WSU, and Foundation Plant Services at UC Davis in California. So it's important to note that while these are certified virus-free, um, that means that they're certified virus-free of known viruses, so there's always potential to be unknown viruses, um, and, and the ones that are of economic importance. Um, and it doesn't guarantee that that plant is free of all pathogens, um, so bacteria and fungi and other um, types of pests. So the chart I have here is a little bit uh, complex, but this is from the Pacific Northwest Handbook. Um, and um, you can find, I have a link down below, um, but you can also find this just by searching online. And this is a cherry cultivar susceptibility chart. So this is really handy. It's not fully comprehensive, but here's a list of um, many different types of common cultivars and a lot of common um, diseases. And um, what you can do here is if the, um, say you're in a region where you know little cherry is common, you can maybe choose a tree like Royalian that only has a mild um, presentation of this disease. So this this chart can come in handy when determining what type of cultivar you want based on what types of diseases um, you may um, uh, see in your area. You can also note that something like prune dwarf or prunus necrotic ring spot, um, that these are in all the different cultivars. But another thing to know about these two in particular is that they don't cause severe disease and they're tr transmitted on pollen, which can be, you know, dispersed through the wind. So it's kind of everywhere. <laughs> um, so those are kind of hard to avoid. All right, so let's talk a little bit about which viruses are prevalent in Oregon. So my first couple of years of doing research here at OSU, I've been here since 2015, was to take a look at all of the commercial production in Oregon. So as all of you probably know, Oregon is a great place to grow cherries, um, the Pacific Northwest in particular. So Oregon is the number two grower after Washington, and the United 
States as a number two grower of sweet cherries um, behind Turkey in the whole world. So we have these great summers where there's not a lot of rain, um, which can cause fruit cracking and um, soft cherries. And we have different ranges of elevation, which make it great for growing cherries at, um, that ripen at different times in the season. So in my first couple years, I wanted to do this survey because a lot of our growers, again, commercial production in Oregon, were saying, we don't have a problem with viruses, but no one had really looked in the past 20 years. Um, so I decided to take a look um, and get that funding from the Oregon Sweet Cherry Commission to do so. So the different regions on this map are highlighting the different uh, commercial production regions throughout the state. So some of them um, much smaller than others in southern and eastern Oregon, those are much smaller production areas than in the Willamette Valley and particularly Hood River in the Dalles, where we have about 12, over 12,000 um, acres. In the Willamette Valley, we have about 3,000 acres of commercial sweet cherry production. But I went out to all these different areas just looking for virus diseases to see what I could find. So what did I find? <laughs> um, so we had some new reports and some new viruses in, in different regions, but um, I'm gonna walk you through some of those. So um, down here in the Umpqua Valley, um, where there hadn't really been a lot of um, attention uh, before, we found prune dwarf virus and prunus necrotic ring virus. And you um, can see on this leaf here, the um, sort of mosaic ring spot pattern on that leaf, which is very common. Um, again, these are the two viruses that I mentioned that are um, spread through the pollen. And we find these, not only, it was a new report in the Umqua Valley, but these viruses are found all throughout the entire state. So if you're seeing these symptoms, you're not alone. You should also not be particularly alarmed because they only cause a slight reduction in yield that probably wouldn't even be noticeable to you and they won't kill your tree. Um, another virus that we found was tomato ring spot virus. And this virus produces a symptom um, that we call an innation. And you can kind of see that along the midrib here, where there's this dark green. Um, and it, it presents itself in other ways too. In this image, this is also another type of innation that looks more like where you um, like shoved your <laughs> arm through the leaf and pulled the top to the bottom side. Um, so there's a couple different um, uh, variations of this uh, mutation, essentially, on the leaf that is caused by viruses. So here we have tomato ring spot virus, which is transmitted by nematodes. Um, and we found that um, in Hood River and um, also in the Dells. And then um, cherry leaf roll virus, which produces another um, a nation symptom, as I mentioned, was also found in the Dells. And this was actually the first time this virus had ever been reported in the state. One thing that's interesting about cherry leaf roll virus is that um, we were actually able to go back to this orchard um, where this uh, positive was found and look at the trees um, in 2012. So this is a Google Earth image because um, this is on the roadside and you can see these trees were looking very healthy and only four years later one was a stump and the other one was in severe decline. So the other thing to note here is that not only can you have cherry leaf for virus or one virus, but you can also have multiple viruses on the same host. So as I mentioned, some of these, as in prudent dwarf and prudent necrotic ring spot are everywhere. But when you add another virus into that, it can cause really severe symptoms, even more severe symptoms. So that's what we were seeing here. Um, the last thing that we found of significance was little cherry, little cherry disease. So we had one report of little cherry virus too, um, but this disease is actually caused by two different viruses and a specialized bacteria um, called a phytoplasma. And the symptoms, as you can see in this image here, are these little fruit. So these are um, fruit that have matured, and then the ones below are ones that um, should look like the top, but they do not. Um, the most problematic thing about this 
is that there aren't any symptoms on the leaves. As you can see, the leaves look very healthy. Um, and the symptoms only present themselves about two weeks before harvest. So about two weeks before harvest, the fruit just stops maturing. And um, so this is, this has become, um, as I'll talk about in a minute, the number one uh, disease um, that is affecting the cherry industry in the Pacific Northwest right now. So I will get back to that in a minute. But first I want to talk a little bit about this cherry leaf roll virus and what happened there. So um, cherry leaf roll virus was present. As I said, there was three different viruses there and this orchard was removed. Um, it was an older orchard in the first place. Um, but one thing to note here, because this is transmitted by nematodes, is that the grower fumigated. So this isn't necessarily an option um, for, uh, for your backyard <laughs> to do fumigation, but doing some sort of treatment to manage the nematodes before replanting um, is, is important. So this has been since replanted with, with new trees and is doing well. All right, so this chart is a little bit complicated, but my point in showing this to you is that from all of this work, um, my advisor, Dr. Jay Scheidt, and I were able to come up with this action rating scale. And so again, this is more focused on commercial production, but it's relevant to all of you because it identifies which um, viruses and which diseases are um, most important, causing the most severe disease, which ones are killing the trees, and which ones you should really pay attention to. So, and this is, um, so here we have the different pathogens. We have an action rating on a scale of zero, which is no action, to 10, you must take action immediately. You'll see the only one I have here that has an action rating of 10 is plum pox, vi plum, plum pox virus, which is a quarantine pathogen in the US. So it's not known to occur here. So if you found that, um, it's much more prominent in Europe and very much a problem there. Um, you would need to take action immediately um, for sure. Um, but then there's some that are um, not quarantine pathogens but are causing severe disease and they're also ones that we found in Oregon. So in the survey that I just mentioned, the ones here with the plus sign, the ones that I have highlighted, um, are ones that are causing severe disease and ones that we found in this survey. So again, that was the cherry leaf roll virus, the orchard that was removed. Little cherry virus two, which was in that image with the little fruit. Um, that, uh, another pathogen that causes that same symptom is X disease. And then also tomato ring spot virus, which is a nematode transmitted pathogen. So from all of this, what is relevant to you and what you probably want to know are what are the symptoms that I sh should I pay attention to? And so the symptoms that are associated with severe disease are anations. And here, again, we have some different um, flavors of these anations. So this dark green along the midrib, these more raised um, protrusions from the leaf, and there's some here. These are associated with cherry leaf roll virus and tomato ring spot virus. Um, rosetting. So rosetting I hadn't mentioned before, but we also see this associated with cherry leaf roll virus and tomato ring spot virus. And um, these viruses will kill the tree within about, or cause it to have severe decline within about three to four years. And the rosetting, as you can see, is um, the internodes are shortened. So the branches are really short and the leaves are small and really bunched up. Um, and so that symptom is, is known to be associated with these viruses and um, is an important one to pay attention to if you're seeing that. And then the last one is little immature fruit. And um, these are associated with little cherry viruses one and two and the X disease phytoplasma. And they're indistinguishable without doing um, molecular testing. So we see the same symptom on um, the fruit, whether any one of these three pathogens or maybe a combination um, are occurring on that tree. So I do wanna point out that we're talking about little cherries and not small cherries. There are lots of things that can cause small cherries and send them uh, to the juicer, which is what is happening here. Um, so these cherries are sellable, they are marketable, but they're just small. 
They're, they're still dark. These have color to them, the ones you see here. There are many things that can cause a small cherry, um, other types of pathogens, uh, perhaps gophers that are girdling the tree, many things. But what we're talking about here when I'm talking about little cherries are these little fruits. Um, often they're found in a bunch with ripened fruit, but not always. Um, and they um, are not sellable. They don't have flavor, they don't have the right color, and they aren't even picked from the tree. And if you have these in your backyard, you would not want to eat them. And one of the things about this is that this disease does not kill the tree. So because the, the tree isn't dying, there's just that much more opportunity um, for the pathogen to spread, especially since it's transmitted by leaf hoppers and mealybugs. So we wanted to focus a little bit more on uh, little cherry disease, especially since it was showing up in our most prominent commercial production region. So if any of you are in, in the Dallas in particular, <laughs> or even in the uh, Dallas Fort Washington region, um, this is an area that has, um, where this disease is really prevalent and widespread. Um, so I would definitely pay attention to that. So for the past couple of years, I have been meeting with growers and folks in the region and handing out these wanted posters, <laughs> trying to get an idea of how widespread this is. And um, as you can see on the map here, so the red pins are samples that I collected that tested positive for uh, little cherry disease. This was actually not positive for the virus, but for the bacteria that causes the same symptom. Um, we had positive samples in Mosier as well and Dallas Fort Washington. Um, we didn't have very many samples from the 2018 year, which I'm showing here in Hood River, but um, I was able to get a couple more samples this year from Hood River and none of those um, tested positive for little cherry virus too. So for you folks in Washington, little cherry virus too is actually much more prevalent there. This is a virus that has um, trickled down from uh, the Kootenai region in British Columbia and became more prevalent in Washington in 2010. Um, but what we're seeing in Oregon is more of the Western X disease, uh, version of this little cherry disease. The nomenclatures are a little bit complicated. Um, any of you in Southern Oregon um, or who've been growing cherries for some time in the 1950s, uh, X disease was really common in the Rogue Valley and actually wiped out most of the region, uh, the commercial production uh, of cherries there. Um, but it was also known as buckskin or albino then due to the light color of the fruit. That's a little bit about little cherry disease. And um, as I said, it's the number one um, high, high alert uh, disease in the Pacific Northwest right now. Another thing that I'm working on, as I mentioned, we had found tomato ring spot virus. Here is an image of a whole tree where you can see that rosetting symptom a little bit more. Um, so tomato ring spot virus has a wide host range, as you can um, maybe imagine from the name tomato ring spot virus was originally found on tomato, but is also found on tree fruits and um, grapes and many other hosts. So, this virus has become more pre prevalent in Oregon. Um, it's transmitted by nematodes, so that can be a little bit problematic, especially since um, if you think about, so I have this tree, it's declining, I'm gonna remove it, and I'm gonna plant something else there. Well, one, you could plant a cherry, and if these nematodes are in the soil, you can be setting yourself up to reinfect your new tree. Or if you're planting another host, um, like maybe you want to plant grapes or something, for instance. Um, will this virus go to that host as well? And that's just something we don't know. <laughs> so part of the research I'm doing is to find out whether tomato ring spot virus that is found on cherry, whether it will go to other hosts like grape. Um, so that this is an infected tree. Um, you can see it's not really producing fruit anymore. This is the dagger nematode that transmits 
the um, virus. In this image here, there's actually an old orchard at the Extension Center in Hood River um, that has both the, the um, pathogen, so a tomato ring swap virus, and the nematode present. And so here I've interplanted in this orchard different hosts, so grape, and peach and apple and blueberry and raspberry and I um, have been trying for the past couple years to see if I can get a natural transmission to see if I can answer this question of whether cherry um, whether this virus on cherry can go to these other hosts and I'm also doing some work in the greenhouse doing some grafting and um, trying to dig into the um, the genetics of this virus and see how related it, um, it is on different hosts. So that's just a little bit about my work. Um, and feel free to ask me more questions if you're curious about that. So now I wanna talk a little bit about um, management. So as I had mentioned earlier, um, prevention is the number one way to manage viral diseases. So um, again, starting with clean plant stock, um, what you're buying at the um, nursery will um, likely be distributed from one of these places, but it's, it's good to check and to find out and also to not just go to your neighbor and um, you know clip a branch off their tree and uh, graft that <laughs> to a rootstock um, because you're, um, potential for uh, having disease is is much much higher and you could also be putting um, your neighbors at risk which is important to consider as well um, so if you do have a tree and you do expect that there might be some sort of viral problem um, getting a diagnosis is really important because there are lots of things that can make uh, cherry tree sick and um, so you can go to your plant clinic you can if you're if you're really curious and want to figure this out on your own there are some of these um, different strip tests available for some different pathogens um, working with your ex extension agent um, but figuring out what's going on so that you can um, figure out what pathogen is there and um, if it has a vector. So if it has a nematode vector, what do I do? If it has a leaf hopper or a mealybug vector or aphids or what's going on, what do I do? Because the next step isn't actually to cut the tree down because um, if you cut the tree down and it has an insect vector, then that those insects will go to the neighboring trees and spread the disease. So you wanna treat that if there is a vector, you wanna treat um, the tree first and then cut it down. So treat the vector if there is one, and then remove the tree. Um, as I said, there's no cure for viruses. Um, so unfortunately, the best way to manage it is to remove the tree. So for those of you who aren't familiar, there is a um, publication called the Plant Disease Management Handbook. Um, this is actually co-edited by my advisor, Jay Scheidt. And um, this is a great resource. It is um, geared more toward extension agents and field consultants and people like that, um, but definitely could be a useful resource for you as well. So if you're not familiar, this is a screenshot of what this um, handbook, handbook looks like online. And there are a couple different search options. Um, my tip is to actually use the search bar up at the top. It's a little more comprehensive um, and user friendly than um, the quick find down here. Um, but you can type in different symptoms or cherry virus and it will give you a whole list of um, what is known um, specifically um, in this region and what to do about it. And so it'll have recommendations there about different um, ways to manage the virus and the vectors um, for both for commercial and um, for the home grower. Um, there's also the insect management handbook and I <laughs> this is the first time I've really taken a good look at this and um, I thought it was kind of interesting that one there are so many insect pests of cherry um, but um, it is also important to note that this is very much focused on the insects being a pest. And the ones that I mentioned that are vectors of viruses are actually not mentioned here. So if you go looking in the insect management handbook, 
handbook, just know that these are more focused on the pests of the cherry and not so much thinking of insects that are vectors. Um, but if you dig a little deeper, you can find um, some information from these handbooks on what different chemical products are available for the um, home landscape. Um, and um, some of these are even marked as organic, as the O indicates. Um, so this is for leaf hoppers. And um, I have a link to where you can find uh, this information. But um, so if you go into this, you can see some different chemicals that you can use to treat the tree. Um, and also there's similar information available for the management of mealybugs. Um, again, I'm not going to go into details of what to use and why, and um, that's definitely a case-by-case -case basis. And uh, I also don't have a pesticide license, so I have to be careful about what I say. <laughs> but these are just resources available to you um, and that you should know are there. Um, for nematode management, this is a little bit different. As I mentioned before, um, in that orchard that we that was removed, they fumigated before replanting. But this isn't really an option um, for growing cherries in your backyard. Um, but one thing that you can do is test the soil for dagger nematodes, especially if you suspect that there's been a problem in the past in the area where you're planting, or if you suspect um, that you're having a problem with this currently. Um, so you can test a soil sample and figure out whether dagger nematodes are present. Um, there will surely be nematodes there. Um, not all nematodes are bad, and I'm sure many of you know that there are beneficial nematodes um, out there as well. Um, but one thing you can do instead of uh, fumigating is to just not replant right away. So the way that nematodes carry the virus is that the virus particles stick to the mouth parts. But those mouth parts are shed when the nematode molts. So if you leave the, um, the area without replanting um, for a year or so, you'll give time the, for those nematodes to shed those virus particles and will reduce the amount of um, virus present and the potential for um, that virus to um, spread to whatever you plant next. Um, and another thing to think about is that not only will um, the tree have this virus, but there are also many weeds that um, harbor this virus as well. So not only leave it fallow, um, but also make sure that um, you re you're removing dandelions and plantains and uh, um, the weeds in the area because they could potentially hold that virus <laughs> until you plant something um, that you uh, want to get a crop out of and it could infect that. All right, so that is all I have to say about cherry viruses. Um, so now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about inspiration dissemination. So this is a science communication uh, radio show that I got involved with a few years, few years ago through Oregon State University's uh, radio station, KBVR. Um, so this is the longest running show. It's been around since 2012, and it was actually started by two graduate students in my department in botany and plant pathology. Um, so this is a show that is on. Um, you can listen to if you're local in Corvallis on 88.7, um, but you can also stream it online. Um, and we're also a podcast. So every uh, Monday or Tuesday of each week, our episodes get posted to Apple, um, Apple Podcasts. You can search Inspiration Dissemination, or I will also be sharing this um, PowerPoint with all the links, so that might make it a little bit easier to find these things. Um, so essentially what we do on this show is um, there's a, a group of co-hosts, about six or eight of us, and we take turns interviewing other graduate students about their research. So um, these are not only people from our department in botany and plant pathology or in the agricultural sciences, but really we try to um, get a transect of people from all across the university in the social sciences and humanities. And um, it's just really interesting learning about all the cool things happening um, at the university. So we write a blog for every guest that we have on. You're welcome to check that out. It has links to all of our different um, 
pages and social media. Um, we are fairly active on Twitter, I would say, at KBVRID. And um, every spring, if you're interested, for the last few years, we have been hosting a live event. So it's similar to a, um, a TED Talk style event, but we have six to eight graduate students who come and give a talk on their research um, live. And um, it would be great if any of you want to join that or if we stream it live if you um, want to see that. So that's just something fun that I do on the side that may be of interest to some of you to check out sometime. And with that, um, I have a few links here and my contact information. And thank you so much for listening. And I hope you've learned something. Um, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Great. Thank you so much, Lori. Um, and we're all clapping, but you can't hear it because you know, <laughs> the way the webinar works. <laughs> uh, so if folks, if you do have questions, if you could put them into the Q&A box, that would be great. And I see a couple of you um, have done that already, and we'll, we'll read through those in a minute. Um, before you leave, we have two more webinars coming up. October 24th at 11 a.m. is Introduction to Growing Olives in Oregon, so that should be interesting. And then November 8th, we have um, Aaron from the U.S. National Phenology Network, who's going to be talking about citizen science and master gardeners and the Nature's Notebook Project. So that'll be a good one, and you'll get the usual emails and things on that. So um, let me take a look through the questions. Um, so let's see. So Lynn has a question on your uh, virus survey. So you have the map where you have the state map and you showed all the different places and she noticed that you didn't show anything in the Willamette Valley. So does that mean that there's no viruses in the Willamette Valley or what does that mean? Oh, great question. So. Um, I kind of was just hitting highlights of um, the most significant things that we found and the most significant things that we found from that um, were new things. And that's kind of what I was showing on that slide in particular. Um, no, we definitely have disease here. And actually the Willamette Valley, because we have the plant clinic here, there um, maybe the reason we didn't find so many new things was because a lot of samples had been submitted um, from this area. So um, there's definitely a list of probably 10 different viruses. Um, due to time, I didn't have time to go through all the details of the history of all of that, um, but there are definitely viruses prevalent here. Um, of the ones I mentioned though, the little cherry disease, we're not really seeing that in the Willamette Valley, which is great. Um, so the ones we see that I have seen in the Willamette Valley are more the ones that we would expect anywhere. The ones that aren't causing severe um, disease like prune dwarf virus and prunus necrotic ring spot virus. Great, thanks. Um, so Sandra is curious about um, that you, uh, it sounds like maybe you were focusing on the sweet cherry varieties, maybe not. Um, and so she just wants to know if the tart cherry or like the pie cherries, are they tend to be susceptible to the same viruses or less susceptible? Do you see any differences? So I, um, I don't work with tart cherries and pie cherries as much because most of the production here in Oregon in particular is, is um, has transitioned, I should say, to uh, fresh market cherries. So most of the what is grown here are, are the sweet cherries. So honestly, I don't have a lot of experience with that. I know the Willamette Valley and um, even in Hood River in the Dells, there used to be a lot more uh, tart cherry production and maraschino cherry production. Um, there are the giant brining pits all over the valley, but they're mostly abandoned now. Um, so honestly, I don't have a lot of experience with that, and I, I don't really work with the tart and pie cherries as much just because they're not nearly as prevalent. Yeah, but they're similar in um, their, what they would be susceptible to. So I'd expect the similar virus problems on them as well. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And so um, Lori is a, is a PhD candidate. So she, you know, she's focused on this one area. So if there are questions that um, you feel like you can't answer or they're outside of your scope of experience, we can answer those offline. I know there's a lot of resources in the um, plant disease management handbook that we might be able to um, point people to. Yes. Um, Carmen has a question about, 
one of the methods of um, that you said about spreading viruses is through like pruning. Yes. Do you have any suggestions on cleaning tools or what could be used? I know there's a lot of stuff floating around out there and I don't know if you have anything specific that you would want to share. Um, I know a lot of people just use like um, a high concentration of um, like an alcohol or bleach, like a 10% bleach solution would work really well. Um, there are also in some nurseries that use um, milk, like a milk solution. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting one. Um, but yeah, there's lots of different, different ways of cleaning your tools, but just being mindful of uh, that that's a possibility is a good place to start. <laughs> Definitely. Sometimes usually I'll tell people too, like if they have a couple of trees and they notice one looks a little off, mm -hmm. maybe prune that one last. <laughs> so that you don't, if it is have something, you're not spreading it all over. Right. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. And I know there's a lot of different disinfectants that um, are available out yes. there. Um, Mary Jo had a question on the, the strips. Is there, um, she wants to know kind of how to order them and what search term should she look for? And I know like Agdia has their brand name. Are there other companies that you know sell them or how would like, how would you get, can you get just one or two? You can, okay. So again, my expertise is from Agdia because I used to work there, but they are one of the only companies, if not the only company now in the U.S. that makes them. So there are, there's a company, um, outside the US that makes a similar sort of product. Um, but you can buy them from Agdia in a quantity as few as five. Um, and some of them are specific to certain viruses. Um, there's a fancier one for little cherry virus too um, that has its own little contraption that you can get. Um, those are more expensive. Um, but the general ones, um, especially if you're, you know, taking care of a lot of different types of plants, they're, they're pretty reasonable, um, pretty user friendly. And um, some of them are even for like a whole group of viruses. So for pody viruses, for example, which infect a lot of different things, um, you can just use one strip to test for a whole bunch of different things at one time. So I would check out um, Agdia's website since they're one of the main um, producers and perhaps BioReba as well. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Deborah has a question about the, um, when you have established trees and the roots are growing and then the roots are, are fusing. Mm -hmm. um, and so she is curious if the cherry viruses, do they just stay within cherry or could they go to other fruit tree, you know, like to plums or, or something else in that? Um, it might be really specific to that virus. So each virus is different. <laughs> um, each pathogen is different, but um, that definitely can happen. So because this is a way that viruses and even phytoplasmas, as I mentioned, are transmitted. And so we're seeing this a lot with little, with little cherry disease and X disease, X disease right now, because they're so prevalent. We're actually seeing it in peach and nectarine and in other, um, you know, related uh, species. So yes, that definitely can happen. Um, and one thing that I didn't mention is that if you do have an infected tree and you are removing it and you're worried about root grafting, one thing you can do is to um, apply herbicide immediately after cutting that tree to the stump. And then that will affect any tree that is root grafted. So the, the herbicide will travel through the roots and you will see which neighboring trees might be affected as well. So you can, you can remove those before the um, problem has spread even more. Great. Um, a couple of people have questions that are specific to the Midwest. And so um, we're not gonna answer those here, but I'll see if I can find some information for you. So if you're, that question doesn't get answered. Nancy has a question about the website for the virus strips. I'll send that out too, so that you'll, you'll have that. Um, Sherry has a question, and this I think kind of might get to your um, comment that 
think it was a little cherry that it's been moving down from British Columbia and then to Washington. And so her question is, um, what are some of the factors that encourage like this clustering of diseases? Is it related to the vector? It, do you have any idea of what might be um, showing those different patterns? Mm -hmm. So this is uh, currently a hot area of, of research <laughs> right now in this region. But um, so with with little cherry, um, the little cherry viruses, those have moved moved down um, from the Kootenai region, perhaps um, through plant material being distributed, um, perhaps from you know, with the climate changing and things like that, the vectors are moving to new places and new regions. Um, so there's potential for that. Um, so originally this virus was found, I think it was like the 1930s or 1940s in Kootenai. And then it became much more prevalent in Washington in about 2010. Um, one thing to distinguish here though, is that the viruses that are mealybug transmitted are much more common in Washington than in, um, Oregon. So in Oregon, we have the leafhopper transmitted um, Western X disease. So that's kind of an interesting um, differentiation. Yeah, and I think it's, part of it too might be that they just don't grow cherries everywhere, right? In Oregon, at least, there's these right, like right, right. hot spots, right, where the climate's best for them. And then exactly, you know, exactly. We kind of, especially in Oregon, we have these little like horticultural islands. Um, and the way that those diseases have traveled from British Columbia to Oregon, um, Southern Washington, are going right through the um, cherry production region in Washington. So a lot of the, the tree fruits are grown in central Washington, which is just north of um, where our, most of our cherries are grown. Yeah, great. Well, there's a couple um, questions holding, but again, those are ones I'm going to answer offline because they're um, out of our region or I, I know there's a great publication that can help answer that question. So um, I just want to say thank you again, Lori, for taking the time to share your research with us um, and best of luck as you finish up your PhD and go out again in the real world. So, um, but thank you so much and we really appreciate it. Thanks everyone and we'll see you next month. Mm -hmm.